Hello everybody and welcome to this A plus 1101 quiz for exam objective 2.6. I think that's the smoothest I've ever said that. It's a bit of a mouthful. Today we are going to be looking at exam objective 2.6 and before I give you your first practice question we are going to have a look at what's actually involved in this exam objective. So the title of the exam objective is compare and contrast common network configuration concepts. You have DNS we're not going to talk in detail about what DNS is because we've already covered that. I'm going to try to stick to the exam objective. But we'll brief, briefly look at it again. Um, but things within the DNS, things within the domain name system. So we're going to need to know what is an A address. If you save something as an A, what is that? What is an AAAA address? What is a mail exchange um entry in a DNS server? What is a text entry in a DNS server? And additionally, we'll be looking at some different spam management concepts. After that, we'll head over and we'll look at DHCP. What is DHCP? Again, we'll briefly just touch on that. What is a lease? What is a reservation? What is a DHCP scope? And then finally, what is a VLAN or a virtual local area network? And then what is a virtual private network or a VPN. I'm sure we've all heard of that before. So we're going to dive straight into all of that right now by going to our first practice question. Let's do it. Question one. When configuring DNS records, which record type is used to map a domain name to an IPv6 address? A, an A record. B, an AAAA record. C, an MX record, or D, a TXT record? And the answer is B, an AAAA record. Now, guys, this one I think is pretty easy to get, get your head wrapped around. So remember, DNS or domain name server is what translates human readable URL addresses into computer readable IP addresses. So we can type in google.com instead of typing in uh, 10.1.0. It's just easier for people to remember, but computers still work off of those IP addresses. So they need to translate between the two. A domain name server is what allows that computer to do that. Now, and a oh yeah an aaaa dns entry also known as an aaaa record is used to map a domain name to an ipv6 address now for some reason i put ipv4 on the right i might have just been uh, a little bit tired when i made this but aaaa is ipv6 okay think about it as ipv4 is a and it's shorter. It's just one A. And IPv4 is also shorter than IPv6. On the other hand, AAAA is longer, just like IPv6 is longer than an IPv4 address. So again, here we go. Uh, the A record accommodates the 32-bit IPv4 addresses, allowing for the translation. Yeah, so I just, I got the pictures mixed around. I don't know why I did that. Sorry about that, guys. But A is IPv4 and uh, AAAA is IPv6. And the way I remember it is... IPv6 is longer than IPv4, and AAAA is longer than A. So that's how I connect the dots in my head there. Further, we looked at a, an MX DNS entry, or the MX record, that is used to specify mail, specify mail servers responsible for receiving email on behalf of a domain. So what mail servers are going to actually be receiving the mail on behalf of my domain, right, or the domain that it, that it's linked with. So it's linking a uh, a mail server with a domain and saying, yes, you will receive mail on behalf of this domain, essentially. You might also be asked in relation to the stuff that we just covered there, based on the given description, which record type is being used. So they might say, you know, um, Mark is using a record that links a human readable URL address with an IPv6 address, what type of record is he using? In which case, your answer would be AAAA, right? In that case, you might also need to match the record type to its purpose. So perhaps in a performance-based question type of scenario, you might have a list of record types on the left and a list of purposes on the right, what they're used for, and you'd have to match those up. So that's why you really need to know what each record type is used for and when you would use it. 
You might be asked based on the requirements, which record type should you use? You might also be asked, what is the difference between the different types of records? So keep those things in mind. That being said, we'll head into the next question. We're doing well. Question number two, which email authentication method involves digitally signing emails to prove authenticity by adding a digital signature to the email header? A, SPF, B, DMARC, C, DKIM, or D, MX? And the answer is C, DKIM, or Domain Keys Identified Mail. Now, guys, uh, these are three really important concepts that you do want to get your head around. Now, DKIM, or DKIM. So essentially how this works, guys, is when you sign the email, you use a private key. This is like a, a key that only you have, and you send that email out. The email service provider sends your email to the DNS server, and your DNS server has what's called a public key. Now, when you combine both of these keys, now if these match up and everything's sweet, that's considered to be you know, a legitimate email. But if they don't match up, then it's like, okay, hold up, something, something's wrong here. Uh, this isn't actually what's meant to happen, so we're gonna send it to the spam folder because this looks dodgy. Now, it is more complicated than that, but you don't really need to know any more detail until you get to your security plus. For the moment, for your A plus, you just need to know that DKIM is a method of digitally signing the email in order to verify that it is being sent by the, the person who says they're sending it, right? So that's all you need to know for your A+. DKIM is digitally signing the email. A+, that's all you need to know about that, okay? Keep that in mind. DKIM is digitally signing the email. Now, we also had SPF. Now, an SPF, it's essentially where you have a list of email servers or mail servers that are auth authorized to be able to send emails on the behalf of someone, right? So theoretically, if Mark wants to send James an, e uh, an email, Mark is only ever going to be sending emails from the mail servers A and B. But if James receives an email from Mark, and it was sent from mail server Z, it's like, hold up, I know Mark doesn't send it from that mail server. Uh, this probably wasn't from Mark because he doesn't send things from those mail servers. They're not linked to his, uh, they're not linked to Mark. They're not, they're not linked to this guy over here. So something's off. So you've got mail servers that are authorized to send on behalf of you. And there's a, there's a record of which mail servers those are. So if you receive mail from someone but it doesn't match with the approved or authorized mail servers. It's like, again, something's wrong here. This probably is not a legitimate email, okay? So, so far we've talked about two methods of checking whether or not something is, is a spam email, right? Whether or not an email is coming from a legitimate source. But the next one we're going to look at, DMARC, it's not a method of checking whether it's spam, but it's a, uh, essentially almost like the policy framework of what should be done when it's decided that the mail is or is not spam. So we've got this picture over here to the right where, and, and then we have this guy in a blue suit over on the right hand side of the screen. And this is kind of how I remember it. You have DKIM or DKIM, which is you're digitally signing the emails. And then you have SPF as well. These are like the security guard down here on the right. This is the guy that actually checks through the stuff, but then you have Mark over here, and he's like, look, security guard, uh, don't worry thinking about what you do with stuff. I'm going to tell you what policy to follow. I'm the guy in the suit. My name is Mark. I wear a suit, and I tell you what to do with the things once you've decided whether or not it's spam. So it just gives the instructions. If it's spam, um, send it to the spam folder. Or if it's spam, just delete it. If it's spam, send it to this mail server. You know, this is where we're going to hold all our spam at. So DMARC is the policy framework that tells the security guard in the form of SPF or DKIM what to do with the spam once it's decided that it's spam. So you've got DKIM and SPF over here who actually do the sorting. And then you've got DMARC over here who tells them 
what to do once they've decided on whether it's spam or not. So it's a policy that they follow, okay? So hopefully that made sense. Keep that in mind for your exam. With that being said, we'll move on. All right, and you might also be asked for this topic uh, based on the given description, which spam management technique is being used. So if it, the email is being digitally signed, of course, you'll know that it's DKIM. However, if it is being uh, checked based on what mail server it's coming from, that's going to be SPF, right? So keep those kind of things in mind. And you might also be asked to explain what each of the spam management uh, methods involves. So just describe how they work roughly. You're not going to need to know a whole heap of detail, just roughly how do they work. Okay, next question. In a DHCP environment, what does a DHCP reservation provide? A, a dynamic IP address assigned for a specific duration. B, a fixed IP address assigned permanently based on a device's MAC address. C, the range of IP addresses available for dynamic assignment, or D, configuration settings such as subnet mask, default gateway, and DNS servers. And the answer is B, a fixed IP address assigned permanently based on a device's MAC address. So guys, we've been through this a couple of times, right? DHCP has a bunch of IP addresses that are available. You join the network, it will give you one of those. It'll give you whichever one is available and it wants to give you, right? But if you have a reservation, you're saying, look, when I connect, look at my MAC address and make sure that you actually never give any other devices this IP address, reserve it for me, and when I join the network, always give me that same IP address, okay? So that's essentially what a reservation is. Um, there's some more detail on the slide there, but roughly that is going to be really all you need to know about um, what a reservation is. So, you might be asking the question, wait, that sounds like a static IP address, right? That if it stays the same all the time. We did cover this in the last learning uh, exam objective, but we'll do it again here just to be safe. So, a static IP address is one that is set on the device. It is it is set on the device itself. You actually type it in and set that as the IP address. Whereas a DHCP reservation occurs on the server side, on the DHCP server. It's simply withholding that address. And then once it recognizes that your device with your MAC address has joined, it gives your device that MAC address. So static is set on the device, a DHCP reservation is reserved, and when you join, it's given to your device. So hopefully that dif differentiation makes sense there. And another option there was DHCP scope, I think. Um, and that is just a range of IP addresses that the DHCP server has available for you. So that's just a description for, hey, look, the DHCP scope is the amount of IP addresses available that it can give out, okay? That's really all the scope is, that's all you really need to know. Now, you might also be asked on this topic, what is a DHCP reservation or a DHCP lease or a DHCP scope? So make sure you're familiar with what those things are. You might be asked, based on the scenario, is a DHCP lease being used or has a static IP address been assigned? So you'll need to know how to identify those things. Based on the image, what is the scope of a given DHCP server? So you'll just need to look at the, just like the image we had here, look at that start IP address, end IP address, and be able to say what IP addresses are available to be leased out from that DHCP server. Uh, and also you might be asked, how does a DHCP client renew its lease? So how does that actually work? Okay. Now, moving on to the next question. We're almost there, guys. In a large enterprise network, the IT administrator wants to create separate broadcast domains for the finance department and the human resources department using a managed switch. Which networking concept should be implemented to achieve this segmentation? A. NAT, or Network Address Translation. B. VLAN, or Virtual Local Area Network. C. DHCP or dynamic host configuration protocol or D RIP or routing information protocol.
And the answer is B, VLAN or Virtual Local Area Network. Now, uh, VLAN guys, take a look at this image on the screen here. It's essentially where you use a managed switch. It can only be done on a managed switch because remember, those are the ones that allow for the higher levels of customization, unlike an unmanaged switch where you program, right? You, you, you can plug, say, 10 or in this case, nine different devices into the switch. However, you can kind of see here, right? We have red devices, we have blue devices, and we have green devices. Now, there's some red devices on the top floor, there's some red devices in the middle floor, there's some blue devices on the top floor, there's some blue devices on the bottom floor. They're not actually in the same area. They're not on the same floor, but maybe the blue devices is the marketing department. Maybe the red devices are assigned to security. Uh, maybe the green devices are assigned to, sa uh, not sales, I don't know, a different category, right? And you want to categorize the network appropriately. So you don't want to just have one big network. You want to have your, your network, but within that, you want to divide it into three sections. You want to have the network for marketing, you want to have the network for security, and you want to have the network for whatever the other category is. In that case, what you do is you use a managed switch, and you can actually tell it, look, the devices plugged into these three ports are going to be on their own separate network, but the devices plugged into these three ports are going to be plugged into their own, oh, sorry, are going to be their own separate network, right? So the switch will treat them as completely different networks. So say if the red devices, or if one of the red devices does a broadcast, that's only going to be broadcast within the red network. The blue devices won't hear that broadcast because they're considered to be on a completely different network. So VLAN is done using a managed switch in order to separate a network. Uh, yeah, keep that in mind. Know what a VLAN is. Understand the general concept. You should be sweet. Now, you might also be asked, based on the given description, is a VLAN being used? You might be asked, what device is used to create a VLAN? Of course, we know that's a managed switch. Uh, you might be asked, if you want to create a VLAN, what considerations do you need to make when purchasing a switch? So, uh, for example, the main consideration would be should you get a managed or unmanaged switch in that case, right? Of course, you want a managed switch because you need to be able to do that customization. And you might also be asked, based on the requirements, do you need a VLAN? Do you even need one? Like maybe you're just at home uh, and you just like connect your laptop to the Wi-Fi to watch some Netflix every now and then. You don't really need a VLAN. It's not necessary. So... Know when to use it, know what it is, know roughly how it works. You should be fine. Now, the last question, guys. We're going to get straight to it, and then we've smashed out this exam objective. You're doing really well. Final question. In a scenario where employees need secure access to the company's internal network while working remotely from different locations, which networking solution should be implemented to ensure a private and encrypted connection over the internet? A, NAT, or Network Address Translation, B, VLAN, or Virtual Local Area Network, C, VPN, or Virtual Private Network, or D, DHCP, or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. And the answer is C, VPN. So guys, VPN, we've all heard of this. We, we've all seen an advertisement. Our favorite YouTube creator, creators are always sponsored by some VPN network, right? Essentially, it's a encrypted network tunnel that allows you to uh, change your location. It encrypts your data so no one can spy on it. And another use for it is you can actually connect to a company network. So if you're working from home, a VPN will allow you to actually tunnel in to your company network and access it that way too. So I'm not going to read out all the information that's on the slide right there just because it's a lot there. For more, some more detail, you can read that. But roughly, that's all you really need to know. So in relation to a VPN, you might also be asked on your exam, based on the scenario, is a VPN being used? You might be asked to identify that a VPN will solve the problem presented in a given scenario. You might be asked, based on the requirements, do you even need a VPN? What is a VPN and what are the benefits of a VPN? So, you know, so long as you can roughly answer those questions, 
you should be sweet for your exam, guys. Now, if you have found value in this video, check out my learning guide at journeytocyber.com for every single exam objective and every dot point within every exam objective, we have comprehensive learning notes, active recall questions, practice exams, both uh, scenario-based practice exam questions and simple practice exam questions and answers to go along with those. And for the areas where I think you really, really need it, I also have learning activities. So you don't have to worry about how to learn, you just have to worry about what to learn and following along with the guide. And it can be paired really well with Professor Mess's free, um, free course, right? So you watch that course, you have this along the side, you'll be sweet guys. It's really easy to identify where your weak points are. As you can see here, it's broken down in a lot of detail and most importantly of all, in my opinion, in order of exam objective. So you can really easily identify where you need to do more work and there's specific questions for each of the categories within each exam objective. So super, super useful, only 30 Australian dollars. I also have my practice exams, five practice exams for 30 AU dollars. And if you want to grab the package deal, you can get it all for just 50 Australian dollars. So if you're in the US, that is super, super good value because your dollar goes a lot further than ours. Now, that's it for this exam objective. I'll see you in the last one for exam objective 2.0, which is exam objective 2.7. So that's going to be the next video. I'll see you guys there.